presented by Vyas Media Network. Hi Sunny, welcome to Unheard with Saloni, produced by Vyas Media Network. Hi Saloni, thank you for having me. <laughs> no, I'm so glad you finally made the time to do it since you said you barely do any interviews. Uh so I feel really great that I made you come here because um I feel from your career, from your life there is actually so much that I can learn from as well as people can learn from. I'm going to dive right in. Uh right now you're the CEO of Nepal Coffee Company. But if I go back, what was your first job? My first job was um uh, if I had to go back all the way, uh yeah. when I was in college in the US, mm-hmm. um I used to work in the cafeteria. Mm-hmm. I think that's uh when I earned my first $5 an hour paycheck. Yeah. Um that would have to be my first job. Yeah. Come a long way since then, eh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that was a long time ago. Oh mm-hmm. god, that was about 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you went to college to study math and physics. That's right? right. What sparked your interest in math? Like So I've always uh, been very good at math since uh, I was a kid. I've always loved it, you know, um in school I used to do my friends homework, give them um, lessons on math um, mm-hmm. when I from a very young age. So I sort of knew that I wanted to be in a technical field, um but you know, not particularly mm-hmm. math. So what happened was when I was in Nepal after my plus 2, I actually enrolled in Pulchok Engineering College mm-hmm. to be an electronics engineer. So I went there for one year and then that's when I kind of realized that I did not want to be an engineer. I didn't like mm-hmm. that at all. And then I had already started applying for my um undergrad in the US at that time when I was there. And um then back back in the day when I uh, from in the school that I went to most people went to liberal arts schools in the US be- mm-hmm. just because you know they were like small um and um they gave a lot of financial aid and mm-hmm. really good schools so that's where i ended up in the us i went to a very small women's liberal arts school and uh they didn't have engineering uh, major there and the only option for me in the technical side was either doing math and physics or or one of the sciences and obviously um because i loved math i then decided to major in math and physics yeah for me I have always not only just hated math but also like sucked at it like you know from the point in time like in grade 6 I remember the first time I realized because I was someone who used to like maybe come out first second in class but the fact that in math I am like as bad as like you know the people who are getting really low scores mm-hmm. the one grade that used to always pull me down and uh, even now you know my friends make fun when we talk about like numbers i'm like literally doing it on my hand thankfully we have phones now <laughs> but for me it's like so hard to just wrap my head around numbers which being an entrepreneur makes it even more difficult yeah i yeah. hear that a lot yeah. and i get that a lot when i tell people i'm a mathematician there's yeah. like oh whoa, you know i yeah. used to hate math when i was in school Uh for me it was the opposite. I was always good at it. Mhm. And then I used to hate like, you know, history, geography and things mm-hmm. that you really had to memorize. Mm-hmm. So that was not my mm-hmm. thing. So I'm a very like I think um a very analytical yeah. person and so Yeah. yeah. Um which is a great skill to what, have. Yeah. Were you, you know, when you were growing up, were there people around you who were into like STEM or you know, family background or anything? with you know you said you also want to you at least try to be an electronics engineer was there any sort of motivation from the family side or anything or just because you were good at it and you thought this would be great uh no no uh so my mom is actually a biologist okay um, and from my mom's side of the family um three of her siblings are doctors uh, mm. medical doctors and and uh, one is an engineer civil engineer so i have that science science yeah. background in my family already and my mom is also a biologist she used to work at um, uh, the food tech yeah here in nepal so i think that is some sort yeah. of a motivation for me yeah um yeah i think yeah. i mean how was it growing up with having very few women or people i meet have strong 
working women around them, at least people from our generation, right, when we were younger. I think that has drastically changed now. Uh, but the fact that, you know, you said you had moms and cousins who were, how was it like having uh, working women or like strong women <coughs> growing up, like influencing you? It's pretty incredible, yeah. I would say. I think it goes back to my grandparents, mm -hmm. like my mom's parents. Uh, my my grandfather, he was very much into, you know, uh, uh, educating his kids and making sure that they were on the right track as far as career is concerned. Mm -hmm. That's why everybody, you know, went yeah. to college. They have yeah. their own career. And I think um, that reflected, somehow reflected on my mom as well. My mm -hmm. mom was always like, you know, you have to be really good in, in, in your studies and, you know, you have to go to school, you have to be um, excel in whatever yeah. you do. So that attitude had, has, um, had, has always been there in my mm -hmm. family. And, um, and I'm proud, proud of, yeah. um, I guess, I mean, that's how I grew up. Yeah. Um, it's actually great, right, that your grandfather at that time was forward thinking compared to most of the other people we hear about or we see in all our extended circles. Yeah. Yeah. So you went and you did um, undergrad in math and then you did your PhD in applied and computational mathematics, That's which right. is like from a layman's language, I think, hardcore academia. Right. Mm -hmm. At that point, where were you thinking you're going with your career, right? When you decided, okay, now, you know, I've done my master's, I want to do my PhD. Uh, if you look back at Sunny then, where was she seeing like her career moving? So when I did my PhD, uh, I sort of knew that I already wanted to do a PhD in math. Because mm -hmm. like I said, you know, I, when I did my undergrad in math, I fell in love. I really liked it. And then without getting my master's or even working, um, the next year I went to get a PhD. So mm -hmm. it was like back to back. I mm -hmm. had no break in between. I think if I did have a break, I would say I think it would be, would have been difficult for mm -hmm. me to go back to uh, education like everyone else. But then um, I got into uh, this program thinking um, I would be a professor. Mm -hmm. I really love teaching. Mm -hmm. That's one of my passion. Education is one of my passions. So back at that time, I was, I, you know, that's how I got into the program. I did my, uh, got my degree. And then I did um, get into uh, academia where I was f for about uh, four years. Mm -hmm. So I used to teach. I did a lot of research in, in applied math. <coughs> and I loved it. I love that job. Um, I love teaching. And then, of course, you know, things happen uh, mm -hmm. because of um, a lot of personal issues and other things. We had to come back to Nepal for, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. for good reasons, of course. Mm -hmm. And then um, after I came back, I also uh, pursued my career in teaching. I, I used to teach at uh, a college here in Nepal. I did that for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I moved on to something else yeah. because um, unlike the U.S., you know, it's very difficult to to sustain yourself yeah. just by teaching. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I assumed that uh, I assumed that after like teaching here for a while, you moved on to the World Bank. That's correct. Course. Just wanted to know how did that job, how did that role happen for you? You know, you you someone you've come back, you're teaching, like you applied for it. Were you also looking at other jobs? Like, how did that role happen for you? So, I came back to Nepal thinking I was actually going to open a school. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I really did. I was, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to open this really, you know, technical school for little kids. Mm -hmm. And then um, after I came back... You know, obviously, it was easier said than done. Mm -hmm. Looking at all the all the things that was happening here, I didn't want to jump into mm -hmm. that right away. Mm -hmm. So then, I thought maybe give it give me some time to kind of know the work culture here in Nepal, um, and that's when I started uh, applying for jobs. So I applied for a lot of jobs. Business was not the thing that yeah. I wanted to get in back yeah. back then. So I applied to a bunch of jobs. I got into a couple of them. Uh, one of them was this um, tech company that was, you know, outsour outsourcing um, or doing outsourcing jobs, which I had almost joined. Um, 
And then what happened was uh, I knew somebody at the World Bank through a friend, mm -hmm. um, through a relative, and I had uh, forwarded my resume to that person. Mm -hmm. And then he forwarded my resume to somebody who was doing technical stuff like I was mm -hmm. doing, like, you know, um, data analysis, mm -hmm. machine learning and right. cool things like yeah. that. So then uh, my resume got into this person. He contacted me saying, you know, look, we're interested in hiring you. Can you come for an interview? So I went and I, I, I mm -hmm. talked to him. Mm -hmm. And then he just hired me there. So yeah. it wasn't planned or anything, yeah. but, you know, it just it just happened. Yeah. So and then I said, why not? Let's yeah. well, let's work at yeah. the World Bank. It's a great yeah. place to work. So yeah. and I, ended I just want to understand just as a simple person who probably <laughs> doesn't understand a lot of math is how does studying applied math or, you know, like computational mathematics and stuff like translate into job roles? Like what kind of roles are there where you can actually use what you've studied not like I studied BCom honors I can use what I did but just just still to, uh, to understand right like as a career if you study applied mathematics academia is one right but like let's say like the world bank role they probably needed your technical skills so what kind of roles do they translate into academia is one uh, you can use it to do research mm -hmm. you know um, applied math is not uh, not just studying numbers, it's actually learning about the environment and nature itself. So you can do simulations, you can use equations to actually model anything you want. So, you can know, you for example, for, me, yeah. for example, you can use a bunch of equations to understand how river flows, for example, like so how water flows in the mm. river. And that can help you then understand maybe um, sea creatures and, you know, how they're surviving and what yeah. they're... I'm just giving you a very yeah, basic Yeah, but it's example, very interesting, right? right? You think, like, not even in my widest thing that something like numbers would translate into the environment or how sea creatures are doing. Like, yeah, as an example. Yeah, that's just a very basic yeah. example. I mean, you can mm -hmm. use it to... My, my PhD thesis mm -hmm. was on modeling blood flow, for example, like mm -hmm. how, how your arteries work um, and how blood flows through it and how they both, you know, um, talk to each other. And when you have a heart disease, then, you know, how, how does the, um, the disease grow or propagate with time? So you can actually understand things yeah. like this using yeah. math, using applied math yeah. and computational science. Yeah. So that's one part. The other part is uh, you can also do um, in, I mean, for example, in the financial sector, you can use a lot of these technical skills to understand, um, um, how do you say, stock market, for example, mm -hmm. right? So. You can um, do data analysis to understand what the stock will be in a few mm -hmm. years from now or, or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that's one um, mm -hmm. one way you could go. And today, I mean, you hear about AI, you hear about machine learning, mm -hmm. you know, all these like big data mm -hmm. things that you hear about. That's everything behind that is math. Mm -hmm. Like all the, you know, background things, mm -hmm. how they develop all these AI models, machine learning models, is all math. So if you mm -hmm. understand that, you can pretty much use it for anything. Use it for anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as a data scientist at World Bank, uh, what were some of your key learnings or experiences that you had also in regard to, you know, you're working in the US and then you're working in Nepal. Like, how was that for you? <laughs> So World Bank was actually a very good transition for me mm -hmm. coming to Nepal because uh, it has a great work culture. You meet a lot of interesting people and the culture is almost as as uh, as similar to the one in the U.S. You yeah, know. probably as global as it gets. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, my, my boss uh, used to tell me, tell the mm -hmm. whole team not to work on Sundays, not to work on Saturdays, you know, not to send out emails during weekends, which was great. I mean, which is what, what you know, mm -hmm. um, it is like yeah. in the U.S. So it wasn't very difficult for me to transition into mm -hmm. that. And um, and then I think the, the kinds of people I met in mm -hmm. that job uh, was just great, like, people from all backgrounds, you know, uh, and then people used to come in 
from all over the world uh, into um, for I forget the exact word, but they you know they had uh, these uh, transition and consulting roles. Yeah, consulting. They used to come here and uh, mm-hmm. and have meetings in Nepal. So people from all over the world, from all mm-hmm. different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. So that I thought was quite interesting. Mm-hmm. <coughs> and you went from being a data scientist to running a coffee company, right? That's like a transition from corporate to entrepreneurship at its core. How did that happen for you? Yeah, so that was <laughs> that was a different game, I would say. So what happened was uh, when I was working at the World Bank a few years back, 2020, um, COVID happened, Mm -hmm. and uh, at that time, I was still working at the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And the first office to shut down in Nepal was actually ours. Okay. Um, So we shut down even before the lockdown happened. So Mm -hmm. I think this was early March Mm -hmm. 2020 or Mm -hmm. 21. And then I had started working from home at that point, right? So I started working from home, schools closed down, my daughter's school closed down, she was at home, she was, you know, we had to like, she had online classes and all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, I still had to work, Mm -hmm. I still was working remotely. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I then decided, okay, maybe it's it's a, it's, it's a bad idea to work from home, home mm-hmm. because it was it, you know too many things mm-hmm. that was distracting me. So, and then I started going to our um, factory, our mm-hmm. coffee factory, which at that time my husband used to look after. Mm-hmm. So I used to go there. I had my own setup, a table, mm-hmm. and I used to sit there and do my my um, data science job. Mm-hmm. And slowly, I started like, you know, kind of interacting with people there and kind of getting to know the coffee business and slowly starting to understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And Mm -hmm. I actually started liking it. Mm -hmm. It was almost like, you know, in the U.S., like how before you start a job, you do um, something called job shadowing, Mm -hmm. where you just go to an office and you kind of follow one person Mm -hmm. to see if you're going to like that job or not so the same thing happened to me and then that's when I like started you know um, thinking maybe I should at least try to do this Mm -hmm. and um, at that time uh, coincidentally my husband was also trying to find a CEO for the company Mm -hmm. and he was looking after two businesses he was very busy he was trying to find somebody to look after the coffee business And that's when I stepped in. I said, okay, maybe I'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. And um, I have absolutely loved it since I joined, luckily. And I've been enjoying Mm -hmm. doing what I what I do. Yeah. At any point, you know, when you were still like shadowing, when you're thinking you want to do, were you juggling two roles? And if you were, how was that for you? I was. um, Mm -hmm. I didn't really commit to anything at mm-hmm. that time mm-hmm. uh, in the coffee business because I was just thinking about it. So, you know, um, there wasn't too much pressure from that side, but mm-hmm. I was doing my World Bank job at mm-hmm. that time. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and luckily what happened was also that um, mm-hmm. the project that I was working on mm-hmm. at the bank, that also ended at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was... I, would have started another project Mm -hmm. at the same time, but then I decided not to. I said, okay, Mm -hmm. let me take a break. And if I want to, I can always go back to Mm -hmm. consulting at the World Bank Mm -hmm. at any point. So Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. how how it happened. Before I get into your role within like Nepal Coffee Company, do you want to just tell us what does the company do? Um, You know, I researched a little bit, so I know it's exporting, getting from farmers, but just like overall, like what is Nepal Coffee Company? Sure. So Nepal Coffee Company is a 40-year-old company founded Mm -hmm. in 1983 by my Mm father-in-law. And this was started back in MoneyGram, um, uh, is between Bhairava and uh, Butwal. That's where my in-laws and um, their family is from. 
and it is um, it uh, started as a coffee processing company. So this is the first coffee company of Nepal. Mm-hmm. And uh, what my father-in-law used to do back in the day when when there were hardly any farmers growing coffee, he used to go from district to district educating farmers on you know the benefits of growing coffee. And then he used to collect all that coffee. He used to collect, bring it to Moneygram, to the company. We had a big processing plant there and process that and uh, roast, roast it and uh, mostly export mm-hmm. at that time because nobody used to drink coffee mm-hmm. in Nepal. So this mostly exported 80s, to India right? and mm-hmm. then some a few Asian countries mm-hmm. like Japan and Korea. This was back in 83, 84. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, that happened um, slowly. Uh, it started picking up. Um, I think the the first time that uh, he sold coffee in Nepal was in Bad Batini because Bad Batini also started around the same time in 83, 84. And he sort of convinced Bad Batini that they need to, you know, um. also sell Nepali coffee. Mm-hmm. And that's how it started. So we've been there since 1983. Mm-hmm. And slowly and steadily it picked up. Um, today, um, I would say... This company has grown to the point where there is so much demand for Nepali coffee. There's mm-hmm. not enough supply. Mm-hmm. And more than export, we supply locally. I mean, okay. we also export to many different countries, but there's so much local demand mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Um, we have our own brands. Mm-hmm. We have five different brands. We support to uh, supply to a bunch of cafes in the country, a bunch of hotels, and we also export. Are you all only processing still or are you all growing as well now? No. So a few years back, right around COVID time, we then decided to expand also into farming. Mm-hmm. So we have a farm in Nuakut. And um, that hasn't been too long. That's only a four-year-old farm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we've also gotten into that. And mm-hmm. then... Um, of course, we have this whole network of farmers. Mm-hmm. Till I think till date, we have worked with about 30,000 farmers. Mm-hmm. And we still, m- most of our coffee, uh, we collect from these farmers, mm-hmm. small-scale farmers. Mm-hmm. If, you know, someone wants to establish like a Nepali coffee brand, right? Because, again, the coffee culture year has grown so much. There is finally demand for Nepali coffee as well. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you suggest like a person go about it? Just to start, like, is it, oh, they need to get into farming, which I'm assuming is also expensive, right? Sourcing land and doing that. Or are there any other ways just for someone who wants to get into coffee? No, I think they should reach out to somebody like us Mm -hmm. because we already have the tools Mm -hmm. and everything set in place. If they're Mm -hmm. only looking to, you know, sell coffee, build a brand or Mm -hmm. export, Mm -hmm. um, reach out to us we will supply the coffee to you mm. you can build your own brand mm-hmm. uh, we do that as well because mm-hmm. we also supply a lot of green beans mm-hmm. to, um, to what what is green beans i'm sorry i don't uh, okay, so green beans is the coffee beans before you roast okay okay so yeah. you have something called red cherries which you know you have to process then you get something called parchment so parchment again you have to take uh, it has this sort of a cover like um, like in rice, you okay. know, that cover mm-hmm. that you the husk that mm-hmm. you have to take out. Mm-hmm. After that, you get green beans. Okay. And the green beans is the thing that you roast and mm-hmm. you get the flavor, the okay. aroma after yeah. you roast. Yeah. I am someone who doesn't drink any coffee, so maybe I'm asking a little <laughs> bit more basic questions. But also, how do you think Nepali coffee is, because you're also exporting, right? How do you think Nepali coffee is different from maybe other regional, you know, South Asian countries, their coffee, or like, what is the differentiator on, you know, why certain countries are still buying or why consumers want Nepali coffee? Is there like something which is very specific to Nepali coffee, unique to Nepali coffee? There is something that's unique to Nepali coffee. So in Nepal, our coffee grows in the mid hills Mm -hmm. um, at a certain altitude. So all of our coffee is grown between, I would say, a thousand to about 1500 meters. Mm -hmm. above sea level Mm -hmm. and these are mostly in the hills Mm -hmm. so that that climate and that sort of you know um, 
terrain. Terrain yeah. is very good for uh, for coffee, Arabica okay. coffee. So okay. we only grow Arabica. There are two there are two kinds of coffee, Arabica and Robusta. Mm -hmm. Arabica coffee is known to be better. Mm -hmm. And in Nepal, we only grow Arabica. And so if you, I mean, you don't drink coffee, but for somebody who drinks coffee, if you taste Nepali coffee and if you taste coffee from, let's say, for example, Vietnam, mm -hmm. you will see the difference. Okay. Because our coffee has a very distinct flavor. Okay. It's sweeter, fruitier, mm -hmm. nuttier. Yeah. You know, it's, it's easier to drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, and this is why people love mm -hmm. Nepali coffee. So mm -hmm. so one thing that I've uh, I've done after I joined the company is is really focus on exports mm -hmm. because you know um, I don't want to just sit here and sell coffee. I actually want to make something that is so good mm -hmm. known to the world, right? Mm -hmm. So put coffee in that global map, mm -hmm. and that's one thing I've been striving to do, and that's been working out really well because. People really like Nepali coffee. It's actually mm -hmm. really good quality coffee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming back to, you know, since you're saying about what you have been doing, I also want to understand first is you moved into a company which is a legacy business, right? Your father-in-law started one of the first coffee companies, visionary in the 1980s. Uh, you came in, let's say, a few years ago. How has that experience been, right? Like running a company that is that has, you know, such like such a strong memory behind it, right? Or has already achieved so much, um, is family-based. And then how has that experience been for you? Uh, I would say interesting mm -hmm. uh, would be the word. Uh, is there a lot of pressure? Not because there isn't. Yeah. Actually, uh, there isn't any pressure. So my father-in-law is, is, is an amazing person. He doesn't put any pressure. So he has given my husband and me um, all the uh, respect, all the responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. You know, just just do whatever you want yeah. to do. I mean, he's there to consult yeah. and and um, and he comes to the office every day. But we are basically the ones who run in company. charge. Yeah, and and it hasn't been that difficult, uh, to be honest. But I think the most more challenging part is. Because the company is so old, mm -hmm. there is um, old culture and, you know, the values are not mm -hmm. the same as I would have uh, wanted it mm -hmm. to be. And just things like that. The mm -hmm. culture is very different. Right. So that's been challenging yeah. to uh, change or yeah. transition, say. How have you, you know, been navigating um, that, right? Because it's like older employees, older culture. Yeah. You probably, you know, the new leadership new helm won something new and culture is something which i've realized in organization is so ingrained that is so hard so just like as as leaders how have you all been have you all been able to uh, you know if you're struggling how have you all started to figure it out if you have i don't know because i feel it's also a journey how have you gone about that you know that culture values it's been difficult uh, because, like you said, we have employees that have been working with us since mm -hmm. the company started. Mm -hmm. So they're, they've been with, the, with us for so long and they're so used to doing things a certain way. And it's mm -hmm. also very difficult for us to say, OK, now you need to change yeah, yeah. doing what you've been yeah. doing. It doesn't happen. So long, no, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Obviously, yes, uh, it takes a, it has been taking a lot of time mm. but then the new hires and the people that we are um, getting newer younger people they've uh, been very flexible and mm -hmm. we've been able to sort of um, you know um, navigate through this mm -hmm. in a much easier way because we strive to hire younger people mm -hmm. uh, mostly women mm -hmm. um, as a, a women yeah. CEO I yeah. try to hire women yeah. as much as possible yeah. And then it's a slow transition, but yeah. I, I feel like we're doing a good job. Yeah. In my research, I came up about the fact that you all, I think once you came in, you also changed, about the, you know, just the gender balance thing, right? You got in more women to work like throughout. How was that experience for you? Uh, right. Just because I feel a lot of time we say we want more women, but uh, we still struggle to find the right women to get that commitment and everything, right? Like that whole thing is also processed and not everyone gets it right. How was it for you, you know, with that, you know, with that thought process that you came in, but how were you also able to manage finding those people and then making sure that these people grew and that your company in general also hired more women? 
it it is definitely difficult especially in nepal to mm-hmm. find uh, good women mm-hmm. uh i always put that as a priority mm-hmm. obviously not every time um it, it doesn't work every time but you know i always put it in the back of my mind and my management's mm-hmm. mind that okay we need to actually prioritize even if you know um a guy might be have five years more experience than than a girl but you know if she's if she's capable i try to mm-hmm. sort of hire hire women and give them a chance so it's i think it's your mentality more than anything it's mm-hmm. also um because i think for women to be um equal to men yeah. you have to give them that incentive and yeah. that flexibility right mm. because otherwise we will never get there yeah yeah so that's how i feel and mm. that's how i've been uh, able to hire women and and um we've been making many shifts in the company for mm-hmm. example giving like six month maternity mm-hmm. leave you know trying to just like give more incentives to women so that mm. they come and work for mm-hmm. us uh i would imagine that uh, the coffee industry while it's a very big i i think it would be a big industry in nepal now right like a big growing industry but it's still at least in terms of like owners management it's probably more male dominated it is very male yeah. dominated uh, have you faced any challenges um just you know as you came in with being an entrepreneur also any challenges specific to being a women entrepreneur I have in many times yeah um many times some examples? I don't think I know of any women uh, CEOs or uh, you know in the coffee uh, industry in the coffee yeah. industry in Nepal yeah I mean there could be a few but they don't really they're not involved in 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 the day to day operations and and, mm-hmm. and things like that yeah uh but for me that's always been the norm yeah. you know because coming from a science background mm-hmm. i've had to deal with this since i was in college mm-hmm. so many times i was the only women in in the room i was the only w- girl um, in my science classes so there's nothing new for me yeah. you know like i'm used to being the only woman in the room right. for example yeah So uh for me that it doesn't bother me but there has been many times mm-hmm. for example i mean if you go uh, i think especially like when you have to deal with the government mm. you know yeah, um, that always happens the, then um, yeah. you really yeah. have to make sure you dress in a certain way yeah. you have to be a little bit more confident yeah you know they would um, so uh-huh. just things like that but uh, i don't yeah. think that bothers me too much right yeah how has you seen your um, leadership evolve with Nepal Coffee Company like you know from when you came in to now um how do you see the company changing because you know like a ceo does is at the helm right they do take it in that direction from where it was to where you're going now like how do you see that happening because of your leadership which wouldn't have probably happened if you were not at the helm right like things which are very you on the direction the company is taking Mm-hmm. Um the company was run by my father-in-law mm-hmm. so um he is a pretty laid back person mm-hmm. you know he's just doing um whatever he was doing in his own terms and we don't have any partners you know there was no no um, any plans to expand right right yeah. so when we we decided to join uh, my mm-hmm. husband and me now we have this vision we have a 5 year plan we have a 10 year plan we want to do so many things because mm-hmm. coffee is is just just starting in nepal right mm-hmm. there's so many things you can do um so i think that we have this plan that we're kind of uh, mm-hmm. working towards mm-hmm. and we've also like i said changed the work culture mm-hmm. you know changed many little things like you know for example if, if um, mm-hmm. you know when you working in inside the processing unit you have to dress up a certain way mm-hmm. you have to wear an apron and just you know things little things like that mm-hmm. makes a big difference mm-hmm. so i think um it has changed quite a lot and and mm-hmm. and um hopefully we can uh we can um uh, get to that goal that we have yeah well i hope you do 
<laughs> yeah i wanted to just go back to like math right since we were talking about it how we can do how do you think your background in like maths helps you with like problem solving innovation as an entrepreneur in a coffee company it does because uh everything i do mm-hmm. um i tend to um not just do because I want to do it. I do a lot of research okay. before I do it. Mm-hmm. So it could just be me also because I'm yeah. I'm that kind of a person. Right. So you know, I just think about like what would happen. I do a lot of research. I do a lot of if I have the data, I also try to do some analysis. Mm-hmm. And um it has. I mean in maybe indirectly mm-hmm. it it does help you mm-hmm. in many things. I mean mm-hmm. I don't use math or numbers or mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh, equations yeah, directly yeah. in my work today yeah. but uh, it, it definitely helps you and shapes you. Yeah. Mm. So you recently won the wow inspiring women of the year this year. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Um so I would say that you know we can with everything you're doing and also with this right like consider you a role model um for what advice would you have for you know other women who are you know looking up to you who want to excel in their careers but also you know have a family raise a family you know what advice would you have if they're feeling overwhelmed or underconfident and you know i want to do this but there's so much going on like or have conflict about oh i want to pursue what was you both how do i go about it like any thoughts on it or anything that's worked for you that you think might work for them i think f- for me um the thing that has worked out for me is mm-hmm. i've always done what i loved mm-hmm. and i think that's really important mm-hmm. i think passion is very important in whatever you do because if you don't have passion and if you don't love what you do uh, you're eventually in not going to do it right? right so i think you should really have that passion mm-hmm. um and i think at the same time you also need to have a purpose right, right? so just because i'm passionate about something mm. uh, but if there's no purpose then mm. um, then i don't think that you would succeed either you would mm-hmm. have to have a purpose meaning that what is you, what you're going to do mm. going to help the society how is it mm-hmm. going to contribute to the society i think mm-hmm. those are two things that are really important mm-hmm. um confidence mm-hmm. also uh is very important uh, now obviously you can always be confident you can't be the smartest person mm-hmm. in the room all the time right mm-hmm. but i think there are certain things that you can do to be confident for mm-hmm. example you can brush your um brush on your soft skills you know um how you appear your physical appearance also makes a big um, difference in boosting your confidence mm-hmm. i would say work out dress well mm-hmm. that has worked for me mm-hmm. um, i think that has uh, been a, mm-hmm. a big part of, of mm-hmm. why i'm so confident just do what you can mm-hmm. um that and um and i think um if if you're confused about your career mm-hmm. always find a mentor mm-hmm. that has always helped for mm-hmm. me um i have mentors from my phd programs and mm-hmm. i still keep in touch with them i think women generally need women mentors mm-hmm. somebody that yeah. they can look up to right so if we can create this culture where you for example mm-hmm. and i can you know sort of mentor younger women mm-hmm. younger girls Mhm. Then I think that would be incredible. Mm-hmm. Not just in their uh, not just in their career but you know just their mm-hmm. life in general right because mm-hmm. women have to go through so much mm-hmm. uh, uh, in their life. Mm-hmm. And I think mentorship is really important yeah. in that. That is something that's come up in nearly all my conversations with people on the podcast. Uh, mm-hmm. right? The fact that oh you know reach out to other women, have women mentors. um it really helps to you know have someone to talk to to ask on how they have gone about it and stuff uh, you know you mentioned you had mentors right you know from your phd whom you always reached out to but you know back as an entrepreneur here um were there still like people that you could like reach out to ask you know when you're stuck about oh how do i go about it or uh, you know in your case i think you also had your husband as a partner whom you could discuss with 
but were you able to find mentors here back in Nepal whom you could reach out to? Uh, so far, I haven't. Actually, okay. my husband is my mentor, okay. to be honest. Well, it, it works great, you know, right? It you does, have a right. standing so board, yeah. You're doing this, the same yeah. job, a similar job. Every time I have a question, and he has more experience yeah. than me in this. So he's the first person I go to every mm-hmm. time I need help. Like, mm-hmm. is this okay to do? You mm-hmm. know, what should I do? Mm-hmm. And uh, and then my father-in-law is, mm-hmm. is there. Mm-hmm. And I, my father is also an, um, an, an entrepreneur, so... Okay. So I have mentors around yeah. me. I have not uh, had the need to reach, reach out. out. Okay. Yeah. But there are people around, and, like, you know, yeah. people with more experience. Which brings me, how is it working with your husband slash partner <laughs> when working together, right? Because some people do it very well. Some people yeah. don't do well at all. But what has, how has that experience been? And also what's working for you? Because it's definitely working, right? Yeah. So what are some of the things that you do which makes this whole system work well? Uh, I So we make it a point to mm-hmm. not talk about work at home, yeah. which doesn't happen yeah. uh, all the time, right? Because I see him 24-7. I see him at work. I see him at home. So that... Uh, I mean, obviously, what you do at work kind yeah. of like probably just goes home with you, go, right? Exactly, because you're talking right? about it. So that's one mm-hmm. thing that we always say. And mm-hmm. if I start talking about work, and I'm the one who does this most of the time, he says, "Wait, wait, wait. okay, we should not do this while yeah. having dinner or breakfast or things." Mm-hmm. So that's one thing we try not to do. Mm-hmm. And also, um, because we're not in the same business, I mean, we have the same office. He mm-hmm. has, he looks after another business. So he, uh, you know, it's not like... Okay, he's not, not actively involved exactly. yeah, in this so one. he has given me all the power in this company to, yeah. do, to, to yeah, take yeah. it to this level. Yeah, so yeah. you run we this don't company, have that conflict, runs. that so mm-hmm. much of uh, conflict. Mm-hmm. So, so far it has worked out. Yeah. But like you said, I know many people who... Yeah. Who so very clear-cut role divisions. Yeah. Yeah. And not <clears throat> don't, talk, don't talk about it yeah. at home. Yeah. And then also, I mean, you need a husband who is supportive, right? Yeah. So yeah. doesn't interfere in, yeah. in whatever you want to do. Yeah. I think that's very important yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 Um, you're also a mother to a young child. Uh, has there been instances where you feel... I'm sure there have been actually instances, right? But, you know, if you want to just talk about a time when you felt the most challenged balancing being a mother and balancing being a CEO, right? Um, I think it's not even being a mother, actually. You know, maybe that's the wrong way to say it. Maybe being a parent and a job, right? Full-time for being the caregiver for your child and you know how when things like that happen how do you navigate it is there anything you do talk to yourself I don't know like (laughs) you know Soloni that's a challenge every day yeah I think Uh, it's a challenge for parents Mm -hmm. regardless of of if you're whether you're a mother or father it's a challenge every day that you have to navigate Mm -hmm. and you just have to learn as you go there is no hard and fast rule as to how you how you're going to deal with that Mm. and especially as mothers you always have that guilt yeah Right. So you want to spend as much time with your kid yeah. because they're going to grow up, they're going to go, they're going to go to college. So you you always have that guilt of not being able to spend uh, so much time right. with your kid. Yeah. But then you also have to work, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you have a career. Yeah. So um, that's something that I navigate every day. I don't think I have. Uh, yeah, you know, but still, like some things must be right because say. in Nepal, I would imagine uh, it's the societal, cultural expectations are even much more and harder than the West, right? Where it's probably even difficult there. Uh, not you know drawing that, but it's probably even more. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know a lot of people because you know I've been having conversations even on my podcast about it that you know that 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 challenge and you know that conflict and they don't know how to handle it like you said it probably doesn't go away but how do you ensure that it doesn't let affect your life or you know on how you think about things or you don't stress about it it gets better over time I that's think a question it mark does. Bit. yeah it does get better over time uh, also in nepal you have a big support system mm-hmm. 
then in um, in the west or yeah. abroad you know you have a family you have the grandparents and you also can get a lot of help so it's it's easier to do things mm-hmm. uh, as compared to abroad um but uh, but like you said we also have social pressure on many mm. different things right mm. because you have this big extended family you have you have so many social um, mm-hmm. uh, commitments um for me i try to spend as much time as possible i mm. tr- i mean i don't think about it too much okay. and my daughter is also now old enough she goes to school she's actually busier than me she mm-hmm. goes to so many classes she has after school activities and mm-hmm. even on weekends she has so many classes so so um i mean you know i don't have to really worry about she's by herself i need mm-hmm. to spend more time but uh, we do try to spend a lot of time with her on the weekends so mm-hmm. she has she goes to gymnastics class she goes to ballet she goes to you know she has scouts so we try to take her mm-hmm. um uh, to these activities mm-hmm. ourselves mm-hmm. so that at least that way then we can ensure that we're spending some time with her mm-hmm. but uh there's no again hard and fast rule uh, mm-hmm. there are different things that work for different people mm-hmm. and then my my husband and i have allocated our work mm-hmm. so you know in the morning he does this 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 i drop her to school and so that mm-hmm. is also very important Sharing to do as yeah yeah that's yeah. very important once you have kids mm-hmm. because otherwise uh mm-hmm. you might go and say yeah 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 um i mean you're an entrepreneur now but you know early on in the conversation you mentioned you know education was something you're really passionate about mm-hmm. uh you wanted to start a school when you first came back um what do you think about and that was this is you looking at in for like early child like what were you thinking then and is that dream still there about wanting to get into education it is yeah it's there and uh, but uh I mean having some experience in Nepal my I'm I've started slowly shifted from opening a school mm-hmm. to maybe doing something else in education mm-hmm. right because um um I think school might not be a very feasible option mm-hmm. but I definitely want to contribute maybe in the policy level in education how to mm-hmm. improve education in nepal i mm-hmm. think that's my goal as mm-hmm. of now mm-hmm. how how i want i i can do that i'm yeah. still not sure but still figuring you know, it out uh, yes yeah. definitely want to do something yeah. in that sector yeah and how is i'm sure things have changed quite a bit right for women in stem from back then to now um where do you think there is still like room for improvement here just based on i'm like not like i need you to have a hard and fast answer just but based on everything that you see um where is there still room like what's happening now and you know where is there still scope for improvement in nepal in nepal <coughs> specifically there is massive room for improvement um in fact uh, our research there was a research that was done a few years back mm-hmm. i think in asia uh, women do better in math and science in stem fields at an earlier age mm-hmm. than men. Oh really? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So girls That's are better in math and science at high school mid middle school high school level than uh, boys. What happens then? And then what happens is once they graduate from high school then they completely change their careers even though they're good. because of lack of family support for one um lack of uh, women mentors because they don't see a lot of women around them doing math and science mm-hmm. right so um, they're not um they're not confident enough to pursue careers in in stem um, and this is actually uh, f- backed by data mm-hmm. and um and uh, yeah so you know even though they want to they don't have that support system in place in mm-hmm. the society and family to to pursue stem fields mm-hmm. and this is something that we can really contribute in mm-hmm. you know like how do we encourage younger uh, girls and and kids to go not just girls i mean just you know mm-hmm. uh, kids in general to go into stem fields is you really have to 
mentor them. You mm-hmm. really have to push them. You really because it's not easy. It's not. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I have a PhD in math. I it's it's difficult. You know. It's yeah, very, I'm sure. I I have um, thought about when I was getting it. I thought about quitting many times because mm-hmm. it's not easy. Mm-hmm. So I think that lack of mentorship and that support system. Um, mm. You I mentioned think you is key. You know, it's not easy, and you. There were so many times you decided to quit, right? What kept you going? Back then and even now. <laughs> um, I think just I just liked to do it. Okay. You know, it was difficult. There's there's a difference between being difficult and not liking what mm-hmm. you do. Right. Right. So it was difficult. I I cried many times. I mm. wanted to quit many times. But then I always thought about what else would I do mm. if I didn't do this. Right. You know, and nothing came to my mind. Yeah. So that's how I kept going. And, yeah. and, and yeah. Is this something? This is just very personal opinion, right? But if someone's like looking at, oh, you know, I'm doing this. Um, it's really hard. I like it, but it's really hard. But it's not going anywhere. And then you're considering what else are my options, but you don't have an option. So then you at least just continue going on this. This is a very like, I mean, there's no right answer to it. Yeah, to just yeah, put yeah. it there. I but mean, I just want to know what's your opinion on this. If you can, yeah, uh, then of course you should do it. Yeah, right. But it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, if it's too difficult, that is really you know stressing you out. Mm-hmm. You like to do it, but it's too difficult and it's stressing you out to the point where you know mm-hmm. um, you don't feel good. You shouldn't do it, mm-hmm. right? But uh, for me, it worked because I like to do it, and I um, I said I have to do this because what what else would I be doing? And then I worked hard. Mm-hmm. I really did. I mean, uh, there were. Many, many sleepless nights, many hours in cafes. That's mm-hmm. also when I learned that I really like to drink coffee. So um, I pushed myself. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you have to do that. Mm-hmm. You have to. Uh, but if it still doesn't work, then maybe mm-hmm. maybe it's not worth doing, mm-hmm. doing it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm. Is there any investment you've made recently? in terms of your time or money that you feel has changed your life for the better? Um, money, I don't know. I'm not in a terms very of good time. investor in yeah. money. <laughs> you can ask yeah. my husband. In terms of time, uh, right? The, or something else you've of tried. time, um, I really invest in my... Uh, a personal well-being. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have always been like that. Uh, we, we were just talking yeah. about this, right? So I really like to uh, work out. I make sure I work out at least like five days a week. And mm-hmm. I've been doing this since I was in college. In well, US. yeah, that is pretty and, impressive. Actually, um, This is something that, um, that you know, yeah. has kept me going, has boosted my confidence, has mm-hmm. made me a better person. And, um, yeah, I think uh, it's completely worth spending that one hour in the gym every day. I think Mm -hmm. that makes you a completely different person after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Uh, yeah. I can I can totally. I mean, I'm sure you can relate. I was saying I can totally uh, relate because I also work out five days a week, and it it helps with confidence. It helps with uh, strength to be able to do things that translate into real life, right? To spend time on your well-being and to spend time on yourself, yeah, more than anything, right? Because that is just for you, and yeah, probably also for your family around. If you're stronger and fitter, (laughs) helps everyone, but more for you. Yeah, Yeah. and also it's a good example for your children as well. Yeah. You know, my daughter says, like, oh, I used to go kickboxing. Mm -hmm. I used to go to kickboxing classes a few months back. I stopped doing that because I had some issues with my hip. But um, my daughter says, oh, my mom is a kickboxer. You know, if you... If you mess with her, she can like box you. So yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? And then she probably sees it and is like, "Oh, you know, I can do this as yeah. well." Or yeah, you know, exactly. and it translates into her believing, and then actually going after things which maybe otherwise she wouldn't have, yeah. right? Which yeah, is amazing exactly. in a way. Yeah. 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 
Sunny, the last question I ask everyone else on the show is who is someone else I should have on the show? Another <laughs> female who it would be great to listen about her journey, her career. Who would you recommend? Um, I'm not sure if you've maybe already interviewed mm-hmm. her. Uh, Pratibha? I have. Pratibha Pandey. Yeah. Yes, I have. have. Okay. Yes. So, so another name. She is somebody that I know has been doing very She's well. She's very, very um, impressive. Yeah. Who else yeah. do I know? Um, if um, you know Shailja? Who, I do know Shailja. I haven't had um, her on the show. Yeah. Shailja Adhikari. Yes. She recently also joined EO. Yeah. Uh, she, she runs is, uh, Euro, she runs schools she and runs colleges. She runs Euro Kids. Um, yeah. And she also has a fashion school. And she's very level-headed and, you know, um, mm-hmm. she runs her shows and... Mm-hmm. <coughs> mm. uh, who else? I'm trying to think. Uh, women... There's not many. That's the thing, right? Yeah. So it's and that's difficult. the whole point of having this podcast. Yeah. You know how you said that, you know, my hope is that if someone else who sees it and someone is young, they're like, oh, you know, she did applied math. I can do this. Right. Or, you know, she did, she did this and she's an entrepreneur now. She's running a company. It's possible for me to do it. Or exactly. maybe someone has a kid and is thinking about going back. They're like, oh, you know, there is someone who's juggling two careers. Um, you know, someone I can relate to. I mean, right. you already, always see people in the West. But, you know, if we see women, Nepali women, it, they're just more relatable, right? Yeah, then you see that yeah. it is possible. So that is yeah. the whole point of doing this, that women see more women out there, yeah. uh, you know, women from this region, if not not necessarily Nepali, but, you know, even if, you know, South Asian women, and they're like, oh, you know, we're from a similar culture. Yeah. We can also do this. This this career is there for me. Yeah, this exactly. And like I was saying yeah. about mentorship, right? This is yeah. in some ways also it is, it kind is, of right? mentoring yeah, younger, yeah, yeah. younger women. Yeah to kind of navigate through through their yeah, life and, yeah and on how they've we gone about any you know, way yeah you know, contribute yeah. to this that yeah yeah that's amazing yeah thank you so much sunny for being on the show i am so glad you made it i hope you had a great time um and because i definitely did got to learn about you got to learn about your life so yeah thank you thank you so many for having me yeah it's uh you know Great experience talking about my life. So yeah. thank you. Probably, hopefully helped you reflect on certain things which oh, you didn't over time. Definitely. So, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Brought back many memories too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Presented by Vyas Media Network.